I want to finish up today by talking about how we, the, the modern way of manipulating virus genomes, how we do genetics and how we study them and how we use them. We can actually use viruses to treat diseases, or we're trying to anyway. And just to make sure we are on the same page in terms of definition, we use wild type a lot in virology, and you've heard this in other areas of biology as well. For viruses, uh, this simply means that your standard, whatever is in your lab and is your standard virus, you call it wild type, and then you make your mutants from the wild type strain. Um, it may not be the same as a virus that is infecting people or animals out there in nature. It may be, have been isolated years ago and you've passed it in your laboratory, but it's your wild type. So that's all that, that means. Um, when, we, when we get viruses from a host, a clinical specimen or an animal, we call these field isolates or clinical isolates. And those can be brought in the lab and they could become your wild type if you wish, but, but uh, not unless it's a brand new virus. Now, an important method that we use in virology is DNA-mediated transformation. This is when we put DNA into cells. We take, DNA, we take cells in culture, we take purified DNA, we add it to the cells, and the cells take it up. There are tricks that we use to get the cells to take it up. It's not very hard. It's called DNA-mediated transformation. So why do we say this long word to describe it? Well, transformation has to do with oncogenic transformation of cells making tumors, for example. We'll talk about that later. So when people first described this process, they called it DNA-mediated. Now you may say, why did they call it transformation at all? And that's a historical thing. That goes back to 1944, this paper by Avery McLeod and McCarthy from right here in New York City at the Rockefeller Institute. <coughs> they found you could transform pneumococci, bacteria, into either a rough or a smooth colony by putting DNA from one morphology into the other. Okay, so they said we're transforming the cells with DNA. This was actually the proof that DNA was genetic material. It's up until 1944, many people didn't believe it. And even many years after that, many people didn't believe it as well. So transformation came from this paper, right? Uh, transformation of pneumococcal types. So we're stuck with it. So we call it DNA-mediated transformation so you don't cuse it, uh, confuse it with oncogenesis. Now when we take a virus genome and we put it into a cell and we get virus out, this is called transfection, the production of infectious virus after DNA-mediated transformation with viral DNA, first shown with uh, lambda DNA. And transfection comes from this word, transformation, infection. It was coined by the people who did the lambda studies. Now, <clears throat> Unfortunately, everybody uses transfection to just mean DNA-mediated transformation. It's not quite right, so we try and use the right terminology. But if you pick up a, a catalog from a, a biological supplier, they'll list transfection reagents, all right? Because it's easier to say transfection than DNA-mediated transformation. But I just want you to know that transfection, in our view, means making viruses from DNA, okay? Now, when you, genetic methods, in, involve altering the virus genome so that you can study the function of genes, okay? We make changes in DNA, that's what mutation is, changes in <coughs> DNA or RNA. You can make nonsense or missense mutation, you know all this stuff. Uh, but the point I want to make here is that a mutation is not what you do to a protein. A mutation was originally coined to describe changes uh, in DNA. So we make mutations in viral genomes and then we study the phenotypes. The, the resulting proteins are altered. They have amino acid changes or insertions or deletions, but they're not mutated proteins because mutation is an uh, activity on, on nucleic acid. Now this, uh, this assay, which we talked about last time, the plaque assay, is what made possible genetic analysis of viruses because you can then start to isolate clonal populations of viruses by picking virus from individual plaques. And you can see here how some of these plaques are very close together. So you, you definitely want to do multiple plaque pickings as we said last time. All right, so plaque assay allows genetic methods to go forward. So from 1952, when Dobeko made the plaque assay for animal viruses, from that point on, genetics of viruses could be done. Could be done before with bacteriophage because they, the plaque assay was developed for them earlier. Now in the old days, people would have their virus and look for mutants in a tube of virus that they had in the laboratory had no way of really directing mutations to specific parts of the genome. 
Uh, as I said earlier, and we will come back to this many times, RNA virus polymerases are highly error prone. They make one misincorporation in every 10,000 to 100,000 nucleotides that they polymerize. And they don't correct these errors. So when you just grow up a stock of influenza virus, it's not one virus, it's a collection of mutants. And all you have to do is apply the right selection to get the mutant out you want. If you want a, mutant, a viral mutant resistant to an antibody or a drug, you just apply selection and you can easily get it from a stock of uh, RNA viruses. Uh, DNA viruses have lower misincorporation rates. Mutations are harder to come by in their genomes. So typically you treat them with chemicals that mutagenize the DNA and then screen for your phenotype. So these are some of the phenotypes you can screen for. As I said, drug resistance, plaque size. If your virus makes a big plaque, you see a pl small plaque on the plate, it's a mutant. You pick it and study it and see what gene has been altered. All right, so this is the old style of genetics in viruses. We don't do this anymore because it's too haphazard. Uh, now what we do is we have, for, for most viruses that are studied, what are called infectious DNA clones. You take the viral genome, whether it's DNA or RNA, you make a DNA copy of it, you amplify it in a bacterial plasmid, so you can get lots of it, and then you take that DNA and you put it into a cell. You transfect the cell, and the cell will make infectious virus. This is actually a modern validation of Al Hershey and Martha Chase's experiment, right? It shows that the DNA is the genetic material of the genome. And you can make all kinds of changes to DNA. So if you had an RNA virus like influenza virus, the only thing you could ever do was to treat it with chemicals or just try and select out mutants from the population. But now you can introduce specific mutations. You can make recombinant viruses. You can make anything you want. And in fact, people are very afraid of this. You only have to look in, uh, online to see people who think that the genetic engineers are going wild with viruses and making uh, viruses that are going to kill everyone. Well, this is not entirely true, of course, but we can modify them uh, at will. So for example, with polio virus, the virus contains an RNA genome. It's plus stranded. When you, if you extract that RNA from the particle, which you can do, and you can purify the RNA, if you inserted that into cells by transfection, that would initiate an infectious cycle. Just the mRNA, because it just has to be translated, <laughs> make proteins, and you initiate replication. So the RNA is infectious. But we can't really modify RNA. So what we did was to make a DNA copy of the viral RNA in a plasmid. And then when you put that into cells, it gives rise to virus as well. You can either put the DNA into cells, or you can make RNA in vitro and put that into cells and it's infectious. So again, this is the modern way we do genetics in virology. You're gonna hear about this all the time. We're gonna talk about experiments where we make X modification to viral genomes. It's all gonna be done with infectious DNA clones. Uh, this is the way you do it for influenza virus. I, I show you this because I wanna tell you what was done with this technique. Influenza virus has eight uh, RNA segments. So you have to make a plasmid for each of the eight RNA segments. <clears throat> and these plasmids are, are very trickily made. They actually have two promoters in them. A Paul II promoter going in one direction and a Paul I promoter going in the other. When you put this plasmid into a cell, it goes in the nucleus, Paul I initiates here and makes the viral RNAs, which are negative strand. Paul II initiates here and makes mRNAs, which make proteins. So you take eight plasmids, you put them in a cell, and you get influenza virus out. So you can recreate any influenza virus that you want. So it's not as simple as for polio because you need eight plasmids, but it still can be done. Now, back in 1918, as many of you know, there was a big pandemic called Spanish influenza. Many millions of people died. But we didn't have influenza virus at the time. We didn't actually know it was a virus. In human influenza wasn't isolated until 1933. So we didn't have this virus, which was so devastating, we couldn't study it. When people developed this eight plasmid transfection technique, what they then did was say, let's get the sequence of the 1918 virus and put it into plasmids and make that virus back again. So how did they do this? So it turned out that a lot of the people who died of influenza in 1918 were people in the army. Right? And so the army kept a lot of their pathology specimens from their lungs. They would take their lungs out and make blocks and fix them and embed them in paraffin. So they had all those stored somewhere. 
So the investigators went and got a bunch of those. And they were actually able to sequence the viral RNA from it. They got most of the RNA genome sequenced from this 1918 virus. So these are soldiers who had died from 1918 flu. But they didn't get the whole thing. So what they also did, they went up to the permafrost up in Alaska where people had died. There was an outbreak of 1918 influenza and people had died and they were buried and had been frozen in the ground and since 1918. And they opened up the graves, they did a biopsy of the lung and they pulled out tissue. This is all done with approval, of course. They didn't do it surreptitiously at night. Uh, and then they got RNA out of these biopsies and sequenced it and they completed the whole sequence. So then they put the sequences into each of the eight plasmids, they put the plasmids in cells, and now we have the 1918 influenza virus. This has to be worked at under BSL-4 conditions because it's highly lethal. Every animal that you put this in, mice, ferrets, uh, guinea pigs, they're wiped out. So we can understand what made this virus lethal by recovering it in this way. Many people think we, sh think we should not have done this experiment because someone, these sequences are published, right? So anyone could go into GenBank and get these sequences and make this virus if you wanted to do that and make a, a weapon, for example. But I think that risk is pretty low. I think the benefits outweigh this, the, the kind of research that we can do. All right, the last thing I want to tell you about is good uses of viruses for curing uh, human diseases. We, we have been able to make viral vectors and put foreign genes into them. And so these are used for gene therapy. There are lots of diseases where patients lack a specific gene. And so one of the most common approaches is to take cells from these patients. Now we're, we're beginning to take bone marrow stem cells out. You infect them with a virus that will supply the gene that's missing. And then you infuse these cells back into the patient. Now, of course, you need to use a virus that will not kill these cells. And there are plenty of non-lytic uh, viruses that we can work with. Uh, but a lot of these have been developed and are being used in very small trials to treat a variety of diseases. We also use them in research as well. Here are some genetic diseases that are amenable to gene therapy. For example, SCIDS, severe combined immunodeficiency, is a defect in a very specific gene. So when you have a one gene defect, you can think about repairing it. Factor eight, factor seven, and factor nine deficiency. Uh, LDL receptor, cystic fibrosis is a defect in a a channel, a transporter channel in the lung. So a lot of these and other uh, gene defects are being corrected or trying to correct with uh, gene therapy. One of the most common vectors that, that's used is retroviral vectors. The other one are these single-stranded DNA viruses like parvoviruses, those are being used as well. Now a lot of this won't make sense to you yet because we haven't covered retroviruses, but uh, what you do if you want to make a retrovirus to do gene therapy is you, you put the genome into two plasmids. You have a plasmid that um, has the coding region to make the capsid proteins, and you, may, you have another plasmid with what's called the envelope proteins. These are the glycoproteins that will be in the membrane of the virus. Now, if you take ju just these two plasmids and you transfect them into cells, you get empty retrovirus particles. There's no genome in there because you, you haven't inserted one. You've just made a particle. But now let's say you want to insert a gene in here. You just take the same two plasmids and then you add a third plasmid containing your gene of interest. You want to correct the gene defect, you put the gene in here and you put signals in it so it will be incorporated into the retrovirus. So three plasmids, you transfect them in cells, you now have a retrovirus containing a foreign gene. And you can use that to try and treat genetic diseases. Now these vectors of course are gutted so they don't cause any disease. They do integrate into your DNA. And there have been some cases where individuals have had tumors arise because these vectors, they integrate rather randomly. They integrate next to an oncogene and activate it. And so tumors arise. So there's a lot of workarounds that we need to do still to uh, make these work better. But retroviruses, parvoviruses, and a couple of other viruses being increasingly used. And maybe in 10 to, to 15 years, this will be commonplace uh, to treat diseases in this way. And here's an example, X-linked adrenoleukodystrophy. So this is a CNS disease, typically fatal. Uh, it's a defect in a transporter called ABCD1. And in this trial, uh, a couple of uh, two patients, two children with this disease, their bone marrow was taken out. It was infected in culture with a a lentiviral, a retroviral vector with a normal gene, and then they infused these cells back into the patients and their status stabilized. They stopped degenerating and 
and, and one of them, I think, uh, improved. So a small clinical trial, but just an example of what you can do with, uh, with viruses.